All right, guys, welcome to the show. It's Robbie. Welcome to SideQuest Podcast, the unofficial podcast of Fitocracy. I've got a great guest here for you today. He was voted uh, in an article from Fitocracy as one of the top 30 individuals under 30 in the fitness industry. Uh, he does a lot of great work. He has written for Schwarzenegger.com, MuscleForLife.com, FitnessBaron.com, as well as his own website, Kinobody.com, and hosts his own podcast, of which I am a subscriber and listener and big fan, uh, over at Road to Ripped. Uh, but before I get to introducing him, just want to remind you guys, please, if you have not less, left a uh, comment on our uh, podcast page, sorry, I'm a, getting off work and still a little flustered, guys, uh, but uh, leave a comment, leave a, a review, let us know what you think of the show. And, uh, and it helps us move up the charts. We're, we're slowly moving up, grinding, and, uh, and getting up there. Uh, please check us out on Twitter as well, SideQuestFM. Uh, also on Instagram at SideQuestFM. And you can find us on Facebook, SideQuest Podcast. Like us there. Check out the website, SideQuestPodcast.com. Blog post, all the interviews are up there as well. But with all of that out, all the housekeeping out of the way, I want to get to introducing our guest today. Again, he is the owner and operator of Kinobody.com one of the top 30 individuals under 30 from Fitocracy, as voted on by Mr. Uh, Dick Talens. Uh, I am welcoming to the show Greg O'Gallagher. Greg, welcome to the show. How's it going? How are you today? I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. So I, I, I know a little bit about you. I have, I have followed you online uh, and listened to your podcast for a while. But for my listeners who might not know who Greg O'Gallagher is, how did you get into fitness and nutrition? Tell us a little bit about who you are. Well, that all happened quite organically. I was one of those rare kids that enjoyed doing push-ups. Uh, <laughs> I was like, yes, push-ups. I want to get jacked. And, you know, when I was, I was growing up as a kid in the 90s, I, would, uh, I had action figures. I played with action figures. I'm like, holy crap, that's how I want to look. Not like these, not like these everyday people. Screw that. I want to look like like fucking X Men. Um, <laughs> and so I was just inspired to become strong, fit, and athletic at a very um, at a very young young age. And so the logical thing was once I heard you can actually, once I found out that you can actually become a personal trainer and make a living, teach people about fitness. I'm like, well, of course I'm going to do that. And so from my teenage years, I just. You know, I read books and browsed forums and um, like purchased like purchase courses and all that, learning how to get in the best shape possible. Um, and I started personal training people. And then eventually I'm like, you know what, I want to – it's cool training some clients and all that. It's fine. But I want to make – I want to do something more. So I want to reach out to as many people as I can. So the logical choice was to do videos, start a website, teach people my approach to fitness, um, do podcasts. And I did that because I felt like there was a void. There was something missing. Um, and Because I don't think I, – I think it's crazy to start a site if it, you're just going to be like a run-of-the-mill site and just talk about what everyone else is talking about. If you have something compelling to say, then I say start it. And so that's what I did. And people love my message. And in four years, it just started to like snowball and get bigger and bigger. Awesome. That's that's cool. Um, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm a big fan. And I've, I've enjoyed the work that you've done. Um, I've implemented some of your uh, – your strategies uh, for, for lifting, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you, you said something that made me want to ask, a question that just popped in. So you play with some action figures as a kid. What X-Men did you want to be? Okay, actually, uh, I mean, I had the – well, actually, when I was like six or something, I remember my mom showed me my, my Christmas list that I gave her, and it was like <laughs> – it, like, it didn't even make any sense. I was like, you know, I, I want X-Men with like real metal like knives coming out of his hands. And, I just thought Santa Claus can make you whatever you want it. <laughs> Huge shoulders, <laughs> like I don't know. So I mean, I wanted to look like like my own version of X Men, which was like you know, pretty jacked. Um, but actually, yeah. So I I was like definitely an X Men fan, and and Batman is hard. It kind of you know when you're a kid, you just change your mind all the time. But but as long as there was some like strong muscle there, I, I was down. Okay, all right. I I I like that. I think we all at some point kind of. Uh... At least for guys, at some point you kind of go, I want to look like this action figure, and your parents try and be like, Oh no, don't, don't, don't do that. That's you know, it's it, it's weird. Um, at least that was my experience. Um, so so you started a business, you started doing podcasts, you started doing 
creating your own programs and working online. So what was your biggest struggle as an online coach and an entrepreneur? Right. Well, I mean, like, like everyone, the first struggle is being like, yo, pay attention to me. <laughs> uh, so, so when I first, so when I first started doing it, actually, I was lucky because I started doing YouTube videos when it was non-saturated before millions of people started uploading videos. So I actually built a pretty good YouTube audience um, early and I started getting several thousand subscribers and so the YouTube was actually like perfect. Nowadays if you want to start a YouTube channel and get big on YouTube, good fucking luck. Like it's, it's hard. <laughs> um, it's hard. So I, I was pretty lucky because I started doing YouTube videos and um, because I was in shape and I was talking about fitness, uh, I got views. But then with the blogging is difficult because for people to find your blog organically in Google it can be difficult. So um, it was perfect for me because I was like all about not about like I was so out of the bodybuilding thing, just getting huge at all costs, just trying to put on as much muscle because I did that and it it didn't work very well. You kind of just get get fat and look worse. Um, so I was my message was focused in on let's how like how do we hack that Hollywood physique? I want to look Brad Pitt and Troy. What do I have to do to create that physique, the nutrition and training? So I started talking about different actors that got in great shape for movie roles. Um, Ryan Gosling for Crazy Stupid Love. Uh, Daniel Craig for Skyfall, um, Ryan Reynolds and stuff like that. So that was what initially got me a lot of traffic because, like, unbeknownst to me, everyone wants to look like a. Uh, well, I guess beknownst to me, everyone wants to look like a Hollywood, Hollywood actor. That's what that's what like girls like. That's what guys are like. Man, like, like they they're starting to realize like that's the look that actually. First of all, you're not going to become massive unless you train for years and take tons of steroids. So, and nor does that even look good. So, so taking that out of the equation, I mean, would you rather have like that chiseled, strong, muscular physique like guys you see in movies, or or, or do you want to just settle for just being kind of average? It's like no, you want to look like you want to look like the action star. So that's what I kind of. So people resonate with that, and so it built up the the traffic. I don't know if I answered your question, but. No, no, you you did, and and uh, like I don't know if I mentioned this in the email uh, when I emailed you, but I, I kind of like the I like it to feel natural and sort of uh, you know like you're just having a conversation. So wherever it goes is where we go. Um, no, you you totally answered that. Um, so so you kind of got your inspiration from from like movie star physiques, and you're right. We like we I think throughout history we've always had this at least. Arguably, I guess you could go back and look at history and say since like maybe the 1920s when celebrity kind of became the big thing um, after World War One and media kind of got a little bigger and things were a little less rural. Um, and then even after World War Two, like everyone wants to look like Hollywood actors. So everyone, you know, wanted to be James Dean. You wanted to have the leather jacket and the motorcycle. And, and you just want you wanted that feel, you wanted that, that persona. But now it's more like the physical thing as opposed to just the outer, you know, the outer layer. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's definitely a, a good point. Cause I too have many times been at a movie and thought, man, I want to look like Chris Hemsworth, but he's really huge. I don't know if I want to not fit in my clothes that they put on me on, on a set because I gained too much mass. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely on the, he's definitely on the bigger side, but what I still like about Chris Hemsworth is, um, and even guys like, even like Kellen Lutz, for example, who's on that bigger side, they yeah. still stay very lean and cut. So even though they're on the bigger side, they can like, they can like, they look normal in clothes. They just, you just notice them like, holy crap, that guy's jacked. But, but like a lot of approaches just talk about eating tons of food. Let's gain 20 pounds in three months. And like, and of course you put on fat. And so you start to put on like, you know, you start to lose definition. Clothes look sloppy on you. Your face is round and chubby. And it's fine if all you care about is lifting heavy weight and getting your arms as big as possible. But if you're at all concerned with athleticism, because it's hard to be athletic when you got an extra 20 pounds of fat. Um, and if you're concerned with aesthetics, you know, how you look, it's not the right way of going about things. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I, I always remember this case in point. Tim Tebow leaves the Broncos and goes to the Jets. And he's like, I gained 15 pounds this summer of like lean muscle. And you looked at him and I'm like, no, Tebow, you got fat. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Tebow's career just went down the shitter. But right. Because you're right, he he lost his athleticism because he get, he really just got fat. Mm -hmm. um, so so with that in mind, um, and, and kind of you know you're 
your big selling point is kind of staying lean and, and to get that, that Hollywood chiseled physique, that Greek god, that, that warrior physique um, in a couple of programs that, that you have uh, that are aptly named. Um, so what do you do to keep yourself below like 10% body fat all year while staying sane and not getting like bogged down with diet and programming? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. Um, what we have to understand, what most people have to understand is that diet or fat loss, well, fat loss really and leanness comes down predominantly to your nutrition. So I right. think a lot of people make the mistake of um, they're not educated properly. Uh, they, they're getting their information from, from poor sources and they talk about, you know, using workouts to blast your metabolism and, and killing fat and all that. And so what happens is people start to rely on lots of workouts to try, to try and stay lean and it doesn't really work because it just gets you hungrier, you know, you end up eating more and for exercise to have a noticeable effect on fat loss, you have to do a ton of it and you have to make sure that you don't compensate by eating more. So exercise in itself is inefficient for producing fat loss, but it can help if your diet is, is, is dialed in correctly. So. I mean, what you have to understand is it really comes down to your diet. Your diet is going to dictate your fat loss. It's going to dictate your leanness. And then it's a matter of how do we make this diet as seamless as possible. If I burn 2,500 calories per day, well, how do I make eating less than that enjoyable so I don't starve, I'm not, you know, going crazy? And hold up for a second because some people are like, yo, Greg, calories don't matter. It's not the calories. And it's like, well, we have 50 years of research that shows that it, yes, the law of thermodynamics is true. Anytime someone loses weight following a diet that doesn't talk about calories, well, they end up eating less calories by following a certain set of rules, i.e., stop eating carbs. Okay, someone stops eating carbs, they eat less calories. Um, and if the whole calories thing wasn't really a myth, well, start, we wouldn't really have issues uh, with starvation. But because when, when, like when people are starved or, you know, Prisoners of war or different scenes when they're not give, when they're completely underfed. What happens? They lose weight. So now back on track because I did digress. Um, <laughs> how do we make eating less calories than we burn easy and enjoyable? And it comes down to a few things. One of which is stop eating all the time. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> right. I mean, because because here's the issue: is that we're actually really good at going lengths of time without eating. Mm -hmm. um, throughout thousands of years of evolution, we've had periods where, like, we couldn't eat for, well, I mean, days, but, like, really, like, several hours. And so the, the um, contemporary nutrition wisdom of eating every couple hours just makes it really hard because you never give yourself a chance to, like, put yourself in a deficit if you're always feeding. And I don't know, I, I, like, most people, the real issue with dieting is, like, once they start eating, it's hard to stop. Like they've had a little bit of food and then now they're in that eating mode. They want to eat more. Um, and, and so what I'm, what I'm headed at right now is the whole concept of intermittent fasting. Um, and that's a strategy that I've used with myself for five, four or five years. And I've used with my clients and people follow my programs. And if someone's, like, if someone's using one of my courses to get really lean and chiseled, and I ask them, like, what was the one thing that, that made this as efficient and enjoyable as possible, like hands down intermittent fasting? When you stop eating, you know, breakfast every morning and eating every three hours, and you teach your body to take a break from eating, and then start eating like two big meals a day, all of a sudden dieting is, it doesn't feel like dieting. You get to you get a feast when you eat a meal. You feel fully satisfied. You're not even thinking about food after it, and then you can really enjoy your day. You know, your day's freed up. You're not, you're not thinking about cooking and preparing meals all the time. And then the benefits of fasting are pretty massive in that it, it boosts your growth hormone levels. Um, and it has a lot of anti-aging effects and neuroprotective properties. So, so, I mean, the research is catching up on fasting and what it does for you. The point is it's healthy. Um, the growth hormone helps spare muscle protein and helps burn fat. And so you're getting massive benefits um, with fasting. And I, I don't overcomplicate it. I just wake up. I go about my day. I'll have some, some black coffee, some water. And then usually around lunchtime, you get a bit of hungry. You eat a meal. And then several hours later, you might eat another meal. And then if you get hungry at some time, have an apple or some fruit. And it's really simple. But now all of a sudden, instead of eating six times a day, um, you eat two or three times a day and you can eat what you really want to eat. So that's, I guess that's the, that's one strategy, intermittent fasting, stop eating so 
goddamn much. The <laughs> second one, the second one would be like pay attention to how food affects you. So if you're someone that's, that your goal is to get lean and you're eating foods that don't really satisfy you or fill you up, well, it's going to be a lot harder. So it's a matter of finding the foods that best support your bot, your best support fullness. So um, and best reg regulate your appetite. So for so what that comes down to is eating foods that are filling. Um, lean meats inherently are very filling. Um, eggs are good, but if you want to make them really filling, you want to mix whole eggs with egg whites, and it's just like a whole other level. Um, potatoes are ten times more filling than rice. So I mean, stop eating rice. Stop eating like grains and cereals. Eat potatoes and sweet potatoes. Um, fruits are filling, like vegetables. And so all of a sudden, you focus 80% of your diet on foods that are not only healthy, but fill you up and provide your body with plenty of nutrients. And then the other 20%, you can have fun with. Um, so that's how I make staying lean year round easy. Like, I wouldn't be able to stay lean year round if I was eating four, five, six meals a day. I wouldn't be able to stay lean year round if I was eating, you know, um, predominantly like foods that just don't fill me up. But because I focus on filling foods, because I start, I do fasting, and uh, it just makes it so much easier. It it, it does, and and the list, my listeners know that you know I I practice uh, intermittent fasting as well, and uh, I I did it on and off for a while, and I've stuck with it since uh, since February, and I it for me it's so much easier because where I work there's constantly food. If it's not people going to the snack machine, it's like all the old ladies who like bring in donuts on like every Friday or like sausage biscuits or create like crazy things they create. And I'm like, you know, it, it's, I have that guideline where I don't eat till noon and I don't indulge in all of that. So I, I'm able to still fit into the pants that I wore for my wedding and, and haven't ballooned up. Um, so, and, and I enjoy it. I, I feel better. Plus I, you know, get to drink more coffee throughout the day. And what's wrong with that? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so you, you mentioned a little bit about uh, misinformation. So I had a couple questions uh, on that. And so you were born and raised in Canada, and, and you're living there now. And I know I always feel weird because um, when you ask a Canadian, like, "Oh, what's the difference between Canada and America?" There's not a lot, but there's like little things. Um, so I just kind of wondered, like, how is fitness and nutrition approached in Canada, like, as a child? Like, are, what are you taught as a kid? that is probably different than what we're taught here in the U.S. It's actually quite similar. I mean, if you look at the uh, the Canada's Healthy Food Guide, right. it's, it's like bang on right, right around what America talks about, the standard American diet. So very, very high. At the very bottom, you have like all the grain products, cereals. And we, we have to understand is that the standard American diet that – you know, doctors and, and people tell us this is what we should be eating is not healthy. I, mean, I think everyone starts to like understands that. Like right. it's it's more a matter of a lot, it's heavily dictated by lobbying. They want us to buy these very cheap, very profitable food products. Um, so I mean, it's all essentially very similar. But I guess I mean, America I guess fluctuates depending on where you are. Like if you're in LA or New York, there's a lot like there's a like a pretty big health fit um, mindset there. Um, but then other places, literally, like, it's, it's completely different. It's just a yeah. huge, like, culture of just eating yep. literally the most fattening foods <laughs> put together. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a southern boy, and I, I can attest to that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, you just throw some fat back and some lard in with your green beans, and, and there's biscuits at every meal, or cornbread. Yeah, it's, like sour cream and soups and, and oh, yeah. butter on steak. <laughs> All that. <laughs> oh man. Uh, cool. All right. Well, I, I, that was just something I I had wondered because um, they're not too. It's not like Canada and the U.S. are like the U.S. and Argentina. Like there's there are differences, but I always kind of wondered like you know what your food guidelines were like there and how you know you were taught as children because we're taught as soon as we got into school the food pyramid. Now it's kind of changed with the plate thing or whatever. Um. But uh, let's let's talk a little about your training uh, and your ideas. So you wrote an article for Schwarzenegger.com um, talking about reverse pyramid training and how to implement that into into uh, your your workout protocols. I started to do that once I read that back in August, and since August I've moved my bench, my five rep bench max from 165 to 210. I did 215 at four. I couldn't get the fifth the other day. 
Um, but just doing reverse pyramid in like four or five months, I've I've jumped up almost like fifty pounds. Yeah, um, that's, that's awesome, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's just doing. I, so I just did like flat bench one day and did like incline another, like separate out my chest just so I could kind of hit it a little different places and, and focus a little more. Um, so and, and and I love it and I've seen a lot of great results. But for people who don't know what reverse pyramid training is, and uh, can you describe it and how you implement it into your programs? Yeah, I mean, well, reverse pyramid training is really at its core just the most simple and logical way to train. Um, at the beginning of a workout, on your very very first set, what you'll find is that you're actually stronger. Um, the more that you, like the the deeper you get into your workout, the weaker you get. Your muscles are getting fatigued and, and they're getting broken down. And you're also your nervous system that powers and recruits and triggers your muscle fibers into action becomes fatigued. So knowing this, it makes sense that, you know what, if we're going to do, uh, if we're going to lift some weights, let's do the heaviest set first. Um, that way we're the strongest because what working out is really for as far as building a physique, it, it's the, the idea is progressive overload. Over the course of several weeks, we want to gradually build our body up to heavier and heavier weights. Like, no question, your chest is looking better now that you're benching 210 than when you're benching 165. Oh yeah, <laughs> like, bigger, bigger, thicker. Yeah, so that's because um, if you're if like if you're not that strong, your chest doesn't have to be that big. Right. Um, we build muscle not because our body is like we're not we're not telling our body like yeah we want to look good build me some muscle it's like no <laughs> our body's like we need to lift heavy weights so therefore we need more muscle um oh, if we could only tell ourselves to do that oh people would be like weight is gone yeah <laughs> <laughs> if only if only we could be like please just 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 burn off, just burn off this fat like <laughs> um, but so so, so it's really just a lot, the most logical way to train. But what, what we also have to understand is, like, let's say you're doing 210 pounds for five reps, and five reps is absolutely as many reps as you can get. Like, you won't be able to get, like, a, another. Uh, six, seven, not, not on the table, just five. Well, I mean, if you really pushed yourself, and you're someone that's trained for a couple of years, well, you won't be able to repeat that set for five reps again. Meaning you'll hit that, that 210 for five, and then after that, you try 210 again, even if you take five minutes, you might only get three or four. Right. Um, it's just because it, it wipes the floor with you neurally and, and muscularly. So what people make the mistake of doing is they build, they, they make good results on beginner programs because they're beginners. Right. And they think that should work you know, going forward. And it won't because as you get stronger, every set takes more out of you. If you're a beginner that's literally bench pressing the bar, you could do that all day. You, I mean, maybe you'd be sore for a while, but it wouldn't really exhaust you the same way as someone who's built is benching benching 300 pounds would. Um, and and so one of the things people quickly have to, to to walk away from is these beginner strategies, like the whole concept of doing compound movements for with the same weight for for three sets, four sets, five sets. In order to do that, you have to pace yourself. So if I was like, okay, I want you to do three sets of five you'd have to use a way you can do at least seven, eight times in order to do three sets of five right. if you're someone that's strong and trained. Um, otherwise, if you, if you try and like kill it on all those sets, you're just going to wipe the floor with you and you're not going to be that strong as be harder to recover because you're just, you're just doing too much. And on a psychological level, if you know that you have to do the same weight three times, you're going to hold yourself back. You know, mm -hmm. you're gonna, there's, there's going to be stops in place. Because you're gonna have to do that again and again, and like that's scary. But if you just have to do that set once, all those blocks, those mental blocks we put on ourselves are gone. This is just just one set, and then boom, it's over. And this is what it takes to build muscle, like pushing that envelope, going harder than what you're like reaching your true capability. So the concept of reverse pyramid training is you do that heaviest set first while you're fresh, and you only do it once. That's it. Hooray! Now let's rest. Let's take some weight off. And let's let's get some more reps and let's let, let's have fun and let's do that one more time. So the the the, the, the protocol is one heavy one heavy set, one mediumish set, and then one a bit lighter set. So uh, I reduce the weight by about ten percent each time. That allows you to get about two more reps. So yeah. you also hit the the different rep ranges. So you might do four to six on your first set, six to eight on your second set, eight to ten on your third set. So you you're, you know you're hitting different weights, you're hitting different rep ranges, but you're doing it in the most logical fashion. 
heavy first so you can actually hit the best personal records, then medium, then light. And what also happens is when you do that first heavy set, you rest a few minutes, you go to your second set, you, the weight feels lighter than it should be. Oh, God, does it ever. <laughs> yeah. So let's say you do 210, 210 pounds, then maybe you go down to 190, and you're like, whoa, this is 190? Like, easy. And so that's great for a couple reasons, um, one of which is that the reason it feels light is because your previous set was with a heavier weight, so your body had to recruit more muscle fibers. Right. So now it's almost like you trick your body into recruiting more muscle fibers than it needs on the lighter set. So instead of recruiting like, you know, maybe like 70% of your muscle fibers on the second set, you're recruiting maybe 80%. Um, and that's good because you're going to build more muscle. The more muscle fibers you put under tension, the more hypertrophy you're going to trigger. Um, this is why relatively lightweights don't do much for build, don't do much for building muscle unless you're on steroids because you're not getting that much muscle fibers under tension. So the reverse primer training is hands down the most sensible and effective way to train for your compound movements. Um, and so that's like pretty much the the, the the core, at the, the core of my training with most exercises, I use a reverse pyramid fashion. Right. For like uh, accessory things, like to kind of fill in, say, the rest of the day. Um, what do you What do you do then? I mean, well, I kind of know, but for my listeners, what do you What do you do? Yes. So, the reverse pyramid training works well for compound movements that you're trying to progressively get stronger at. Um, but then there are other exercises where you don't necessarily want to just go really heavy. Um, and try and get as strong at them as possible because they just don't, they're not designed for that. So one of the examples is la are lateral raises. Dumbbell lateral raises, right. I mean, you're just not, like if you try and go heavy for four to six reps, it's going to like, you're not going to really feel in your muscle, it's just going to be stressing the joint. Mm -hmm. um, certain exercises, and this is why a lot of people make, I see this with some, quite a few fitness experts and authors, they will lock themselves down to one little training style or one little rep range. Um, and they'll apply that across the board. So maybe they'll say, like, you know, eight sets of three reps is the best way to train. And then they'll do that on lateral raises and, like, leg extensions and, like, abs. And you're, like, really, th like, you're going to, like, get a great workout doing three reps on, like, leg raises or yeah. lateral raises. It, you just don't feel it. So you have to be flexible. Um, and so with a lot of exercises, um, I like to use a principle that kind of is similar to reverse pyramid training in the idea that reverse pyramid training is designed to, um, you're getting maximal muscle contraction with heavy weight, and then also you're getting that on the lighter weights. Well, with reverse pyramid training, well, sorry, the other protocol uses rest pause training heavily, and that's a, that's great for hypertrophy. Um, you're not going to build as much strength with it, but like if you let's say you're doing your your uh, shoulders, you might do heavy reverse pyramid training shoulder presses, and then to get some more growth. Um, you might do uh, rest, pause, lateral raises. So with rest, pause, lateral raises, the idea is to make a lightweight as effective as possible. How do we take a lightweight? Because this exercise responds best to a lightweight, lighter weight. And how do we get as much muscle growth to happen? And so what we found is that um, when you do 15 reps, for example, the first 12 or so, 10 to 12, you're, gonna, you're getting limited muscle fiber recruitment. But now at rep number 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, it gets really, really tough. So to complete those reps, your body has to bring more muscle fibers into action. And so those last, like, three, four reps are the ones that are the most effective. Um, and the first 10 were, was almost like getting you ready to, to promote those muscle gains. So if you actually just rest, so after doing 15 reps, if you were to rest 10, 20 seconds and then pick up the weight and do a couple more reps, your body would still be using um, the full, the full um, recruitment. So instead of doing, like, three sets or four sets of the lightweight, do one set. It's called the activation set. Go as many reps as you can, um, and then rest 10, 20 seconds, and then try and get like um, a few reps. You know, I, it usually end, ends up being a third of the reps that you did on your first set. So if you did 15 lateral raises, you might get five on your on your uh, on your little mini sets. So you do 15 reps, you rest 10 to 20 seconds, you do five. You rest 10 to 20 seconds, you do five again, and you do about four of those, and you'll find that builds. That triggers muscle growth like nothing else. Yeah, I, I, I did that um, for a couple of things just to end the, the workout. And the great thing about doing rest pause is I don't have to do cardio because it pretty much kicks my ass anyways. Because, dude, resting like 15 seconds, holy – I think one day I, 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 literally, I, I, I had to stop. Like I couldn't get the third rep in because I was like I just – 
I couldn't breathe. My my arms were like, no, uh, uh-uh, we're not, we're we're done. Um, and what exercise was that? Which one? What exercise? Were you doing? Uh, I th- actually, I think it was uh, incline flies because I had like, I had like twenty uh, fives, and I did like fifteen, and then I rested like fifteen seconds, and then on like that third one, I came in and like I got the squeeze, but like my arms were like, we're not going out for a fourth, and I was like, all right, I'm done, I'm done. Yeah, it, it is It is good for – I mean, that's one of the benefits is the reverse pyramid training is great for building strength and power and building muscle, but you don't get the conditioning benefits because you're taking long rest periods. Um, with rest pause training, you actually build some like some good conditioning. And, uh, yeah, if you're doing rest pause, like even like lateral raises rest pause, like you're like <sighs> – Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it's great to make sure – like to, to maintain good conditioning and, and stamina. Yeah, it is. Uh, I, I got a couple more here for you, a couple of fun ones first. Um, so it is it is the, the holiday season. Um, so what book from 2014 would you give out as a Christmas gift this year to all of your closest friends if you could? Okay, that's a good question. Um, which book? Well, I would say I would say I would actually give out an audio book, um, and that would be Practicing the Power of Now which I think is brilliant. Like, I think if there's one thing that can change your life more than anything, it's learning to disidentify from your mind and your, your ego. Um, that skill set, like, carries over to everything you can imagine. Okay. All your, like, all the pain that we create in our life, all the stress, all the unhappiness, it's mind-created. Um, and when you are able to pull away from that and to experience life in a, in, in a state of presence, well, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And I think more and more people are, are starting to like become interested with this whole, with this whole concept. And so um, Eckhart Tolle wrote a book called Power of the Now explaining like, you know, his, his uh, experience with becoming present because um, he, he, he kind of realized that all of his, like he was, Oh, essentially, like borderline suicidal because he just he just had this mind entity constantly like creating all this uh, stress and, and all that. But but I don't, I don't know. The, you know the the point is is that like literally th- this book with this listening to it is actually more powerful than reading it. It okay. really gets you into that state of presence and, and gets you to like relax your thoughts. But literally, it will. I don't know. Like I don't need to talk about this forever. But like it will change your life. Like it will. And I get my clients to do this um, because most often when you're working towards a goal, you make it 10 times harder than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And fitness is like the easiest example because um, what happens is, let's say um, you want to uh, get, get, let's say we have a a Joe listening, let's say Joe's listening to the podcast and he wants to be 8% body fat. And right now he's 20%. And so what happens is most people put, um, they, they obsess about this goal, you know, and they tie their self-worth to the goal. So some way or another they tell themselves, I can only be happy and fulfilled when I have 6 8% body fat. Yeah. And so what that does is it sets them up for failure because now this entire journey, maybe it's going to take three months, four months, six months, towards their goal of 8% body fat is a waste of life. They're not happy. They've told themselves they can't be happy during this process, and usually they're going to stress out about it. They're going to think about it all the time, and it's just going to – it's like a ball and chain that you're just dragging along. Um, but when you are able to truly – and as well, I mean, all the, all the negative thought patterns that we have are what keep us stuck where we are. So mm-hmm. if you're someone that's overweight that struggles with dieting and fitness, well, there's a million – there's a million words in, playing in your head that are keeping each day that are keeping you stuck in that in that place. You know, maybe you're like you, you tell yourself, you know, I don't, I don't have the time to exercise, or this stuff is too hard, or um, it could be anything, you know. Um, and in order to break free of those thought patterns that hold you in place, you have to learn to observe your mind, and that's exactly what you learn in practicing the power now: how to observe your mind, how to like break free of these these negative thought patterns. And then in that process, you can create positive thoughts that support you and your goals. Yeah, I think and breaking away from negative thought patterns is, I think is, is one of the 
if you can do it and you're looking to make a change and get healthy and, and lose weight, then you're going to succeed. But getting away from those negative thought patterns is, is really hard. Um, and I, you know, my, my, I've said this a few times to, on a podcast with a few other guests, but uh, one thing my wife and I started to do um, that I stole from someone, idea somewhere, is like at the end of the day, we have to tell each other two good things that happened that day. Just so you kind of start to cultivate this idea of, you know what, good things do happen in the day instead of just like hating everything or, or being so negative so that when you wake up in the morning, you can look back and go, today is going to be a good day. Yesterday was good. These two things happened. I, I think I think we can face it. Um, so so on that, that kind of leads into a, to a question I, um, I had for you. Um, so building habits, and I know you've wrote about this in a few of your blog posts, um, about building healthy habits and, and how getting to the weight or the goal or the, the body that you want is just kind of building good, smart habits and consistently pulling through with those habits and, and achieving them each day. So what habit or routine was the toughest for you to change as you kind of got into the fitness world? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to say that I like that, that whole idea of, of sharing two positive things that happened that day. Uh, that's really cool. Yeah, that like literally trains your brain to start to become focused on the positive, the good, and just creates a state of positive abundance. That's brilliant. Um, yeah. and it's not it's not easy sometimes because some days you're like, um, uh, I sat at work and did mindless book work. I don't I don't know. Like it it can be tough, but just finding just something. Right. Yeah. No, that's very cool. Uh, because I mean, why, and if because I mean, it's easy to like try and feed off the negative stuff because in your, it, when you're like controlled by your ego, that's what it thrives off of. That gives you an enhanced sense of identity um, about being hard done by or this is unfair and it just strengthens that, that negative identity. And so when you have to be like, okay, think of something positive. If you, if you, just to pull away for a second, if you find someone that's really angry about something, you can't get them to think about anything positive. They, they won't accept it. <laughs> like, like, they, they won't. Because they're, they're, they're stuck in that low frequency. They're stuck in that negative thought pattern. And the only thing they'll look for is more negative stuff. Because it attracts, it attracts the same thing. So, I mean, they'll, they'll be, like, looking for more negative stuff. But when you break free of that and start to, like, force yourself to think of something positive, you start to create more of a positive, um, successful um, mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, and now to, to answer your question, um, what was your question again? What? what what habit or routine was the toughest for you to change as you kind of got into fitness and getting getting in shape? Right. right. Um, I would say I always loved working out. For me, getting to the gym is, is is easy. It's not even a problem. Like I don't miss workouts unless I'm like, okay, I need, I really do need to rest. Yeah. Then it's a workout. But especially when you're you're not training like seven days a week, you know. Right. Easy right. At the gym. It's fun and, um, but. But the hard thing for me was, um, you know, just eating habits, uh, changing your eating habits. It's it's a lot it's a lot more difficult um, because that's something that carries over the entire day. Like you only have to go work out, you know, an hour, a few days a week, but your eating habits are take course of the whole day. So if you're someone that just is eating all the time, snacking, they see food and they eat it. It's hard to break through those habits. So, I mean, what I did initially, this is years ago, I just forced myself to write down, record everything I ate. And then uh, all of a sudden, all the, all the, all the, uh, the, the, board, the mindless eating, the eating because I'm bored, all that, it stopped because I would actually, if I was going to eat food, I'd be like, I'm, I'm, I have to write it down or I'd record it. And then, um, and, then, uh, and then all of a sudden, you're like, wait, do I really need to eat? Do I, do I really need food or am I just bored? And then you, you start to work through those those uh, eating issues, and then like to take that to next like another level when you start to like track your macronutrients. Mm -hmm. Maybe you do it for a couple months or whatever, but you track to see how much protein, carbs, and fats you're getting, um, and then you then you start to eat for your body's needs, not because of like you know weird reasons. Um, so that that so, I mean that like. That was the hardest thing, but it, once you start to put those places, the steps in place, it's really not that hard. Right, I, I agree. I think that that was one struggle for me was was getting writing everything down. And um, luckily, you know, when I finally got my butt in the gym, uh, photography was out, so I could like record all of that. But I still was like, man, I can eat whatever. I'm working out. Uh, no, it no. 
<laughs> it worked for a little while, but uh, New York City pizza, yeah, that that not macro healthy. Not macro um, friendly, yeah. Not, not macro friendly. Um, you just have two slices. Well, yeah, but you know it's so large and thin that it just your body is like, give me more, and then you I know. Time, I know, I know. I, I, I would if I'm gonna enjoy pizza, like give me six slices. <laughs> agreed, agreed. So, so on that, um, I, I, I hate using this word, and I wanna, I wanna, I think it's one thing that the fitness industry needs to get rid of is, is the cheat meal. But what if, if there is a cheat food that you don't normally eat? What is your cheat food that you do enjoy to indulge in occasionally? You know what, man? I probably like. You know, you should see my diet. Um, it's, it, 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 it's like, yeah, the whole notion of cheat doesn't really exist. Um, I've, I've gotten into my most shredded condition eating frozen yogurt ice cream almost every night. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess what would, a, for me, what would qualify as like a cheap meal would be like literally just eating a ton of food without any, like, without any consciousness about how much you're, you're taking in. So it's yeah. like literally just going out of your way to eat a ton of food and like not care. Um, but if you're like, if you're, let's say I love burgers and I've fasted that day, I've gave myself room, I'm having like, you know, two double patties, I'll eat the burgers and I'll probably have some calories left over later in the day and I'll eat another meal. And it, that wasn't a cheap meal for me. I'm, I'm right where my requirements are. I probably feel pretty good. And so it's fine. So, I mean, yeah, for, for me, like I, um, I enjoy quote unquote cheap foods, but in a non cheaty way. So, I mean, I'll have frozen yogurt ice cream. And the reason I should pick frozen yogurt ice cream is because regular ice cream, if I'm having a big bowl, it's like a crazy amount of calories. It's not worth it. But frozen yogurt ice cream is has so much more food volume because they take a lot of the fat out. So you can have a huge bowl for far less calories. And then I throw some chocolate chips on it because it just makes it so good. Mm -hmm. um, but and, and French fries. I eat French fries all the time. Or I'll do potato wedges or whatnot. But, I mean, I don't really have cheap foods. I'll eat what I want. I just will work in the um, – I'll make room for it. Um, but I guess like, yeah, I mean, I, because I use intermittent fasting, I can pretty much eat whatever I want and get shredded as long as I'm accountable for like the, for how much I'm kind of taking in. So if mm -hmm. I have six slices of pizza, then I know my next meal is going to have to be pretty good. Right. Right. Um, and I actually, I, I heard someone say once that a, a good diet idea when you're on vacation is have like one bad meal a day and then like eat, you know, smart the, the rest of the time if you're on vacation. That's, that's um, a good, good strategy. And I'll just point out one last thing is that, like, um, if you're going to be, like, being really relaxed with your eating, you don't have to obsess about your protein intake. So one mistake people will make is, like, they'll, they'll, they'll have eaten kind of, like, quote-unquote, cheaty foods, um, and then their calories are probably still okay. Like, if they fasted, the calories are probably still okay, but then, like, they're freaking out, like, wait, did I get enough protein? Do <laughs> you have enough protein? And and then they'll like literally go and like they'll they'll, they'll make they'll eat like another five six hundred calories of protein foods and now they went way over the calories they're probably gonna put on some fat and you don't have to worry too much about about protein um, as much as people would tell you you have to so protein is great keeping you full on a diet but if you've already hit your calories and you're already feeling good you didn't get that much protein in well don't worry it's fine like. <laughs> like it, you, you'll survive. I, 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 I've been eating about 120 to 150 grams of protein per day at a body weight of 180, and I've been making gains in the gym. And it's like, it's like, uh, but obviously, my one anecdotal piece of evidence of myself doesn't apply across the entire board. Right. That said, the the need for protein is is far overdone. We only need you only need about 0.82 grams per pound. Um, but if you get a little bit less than that, it's not like you're not going to build muscle because it's just like the most optimal amount is 0.82. If you fall a bit short, you're still probably okay. You're still probably getting, going to get like 95, 98% of the benefit. Um, but then if you go way over, well now you don't have as much room for fats and carbs. And these are what are needed to fuel hormonal functioning, testosterone, um, carbs are needed to support training. And so point is don't forget about your protein. <laughs> That's the point. Okay, gotcha. All right, so New Year is is coming up, uh, and everyone, you know, 
not everyone, but lots of people get lax during the holidays and then makes a New Year resolution to lose all of the Christmas and Thanksgiving weight. Um, so, so many people, you know, usually have this, there's this weird thing, I guess, that a lot of people think in the industry that, you know, if I just do crunches or like leg raises and do like a thousand of them, I can burn all the fat in the area around like my belly and I can totally get abs. Unfortunately, that's not really the case because your body's going to burn fat from wherever it wants to burn. Um, I read an article from, and I don't remember who it was from, that said the last place, the first place you stored it is the last place it will burn, that it'll actually burn the last place it stored um, first or in like reverse order or something. Right, right. Um, so what do you tell someone who comes to you and says, man, I want abs and fat loss in the midsection? Right. Um, well, actually, you, you do hear people talk about like the hormonal effects of body fat storage, but I think that's like so overblown. Like, don't even have to worry about that. Like, people that store fat in their legs have high estrogen or whatever. But, but um, I mean, that's like I think that's more like a matter of like marketing and and, and, and like reach people, like making people like it's like oh well, spot reduction isn't true, but oh, these hormones dictate where you store fat, and so I wouldn't worry about that at all, to be honest. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, what would I tell? What would I tell these people? Um, if they want to lose fat in the midsection, yeah, I'd be like, well, you'll let's say that let's say someone's like two hundred pounds and twenty percent body fat. Well, I'll be like, well, you know, what? your your midsection will probably look pretty good when you're about one eighty and stronger. So it's just a matter of getting to a lower body weight for people that have that are, are too heavy, that have too much fat, um, and. What I see is sometimes with clients, like literally, they'll be dropping fat, but their stomach won't change at first, and their chest will slim, like their chest will get lean, so the fat deposits in their chest will start to slim down, and then their shoulders and their arms will get lean, and, and then like their legs will get slimmer. And so for some guys, the last place they lose fat is their stomach. Yeah. Um, it, this is a matter of, this is called body fat distribution. It's, it's more genetic than anything. Forget about like the, the hormonal implications. Um, so for some, for example, someone like me, I have great body fat distribution. Where if I'm pretty big, like if I'm like I'm I'm only I'm like five ten, um, essentially average height. But at like one ninety, my abs can be there. That's because my body stores body fat pretty well. Like that's because of, I have a lot of muscle, but also because I store body fat pretty well, pretty evenly throughout my entire body. Um, but then I also get like a chunky face. So. Like, it depends. I mean, like, someone, like, for me, for example, if I'm at 15% body fat, my face looks like, get, like, is big and chunky. Um, but someone else, they might be 15% body fat, their face is, like, skinny and angular, but they just have a lot more fat in the midsection. So these are all things you can't control. Um, usually, if someone wants to lose fat in their midsection, I'm like, yo, well, you're going to have to lose fat in a, 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 in a bunch of other places before you even get there. So get ready. Like, strap on. Like, the first 10 pounds will probably come off of your chest, shoulders, and arms. And then I'll come off of your waist. Um, that's for someone that has certain type of body fat distribution. And right. these people, these people kind of hate. They hate life because when they get to like eight percent body fat and their abs are shredded, it's they, they, they complain because like their family is like, "Yo, you're looking skinny. Your face is gone and stuff like that." And so, but the cure is just build more muscle, get stronger. Because if you're like, if you're six foot one and shredded at one fifty, of course you're gonna look skinny and sick. Right. Like. Like get up to like you know 175, and that's not an that's not an issue. Um, but yeah, body fat distribution, you know, you're either you're either lucky or you're not. I mean, and you either, I mean there, there, there's pros and cons to however you distribute your body fat. But you know what? If you want to get that last bit of fat off, me, everyone else, it's going to be the last. Like the lower abs is going to be the last place you you lean up for sure. Yep, I I can I can attest to that. It took me. Everywhere else got skinny before my wedding. That was the last, the last part. And then after the wedding, that was the first part that got back. Stupid haggis. God <laughs> damn it, Scotland. It's so good. Um, the, way, the way to know when you're really lean enough, like this is what I call like, this is like max level of definition you'll ever want, is when like in the morning under good lighting, you look, you pull up your shirt, you look in the mirror, and you got veins on your lower abs. That's like the like that's like the really like that's a really defined level of body fat and like if you guys never heard of the veins and abs thing, well now that you know of it, you'll like you'll see it like when you see fitness models, but lower ab veins, lower ab veins. So everyone who's fully shredded has lower ab veins. No lower ab veins, not shredded. Uh, so, so so keep that in mind. And you know what? Not everyone's gonna want to get lower ab veins. It's a very low body fat, but 
Um, right. It's cool to work towards, yeah. Okay. All right, so a couple quick fire questions before uh, um, I'll, I'll let you go on and talk a little about uh, any new things you have going on and, and, and stuff in, in the biz. Um, so what are any authors or musicians that you're digging on right now? Authors or musicians? So unfortunately, I am I, I pay little attention to uh, the the musical world. I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate music like no one else. Like music can pump me up and excite me like 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 crazy, but I just I don't know. I just I only have so much time and and, and interest. So I mean, I'm big into movies and TV shows. Um, okay, dude, what movie or TV? What TV show are you digging right now? Uh, okay. Well, I would say I mean, this past summer I was watching Ray Donovan, which was awesome. Okay. Was so good. It's with Lee Schreiber. Um, yeah. HBO drama. Um, and then I'm excited for Shameless, uh, which is a uh, pretty sweet HBO show again. That's starting in January. Um, but actually right now, there hasn't, haven't really been much on that's been catching my eye. Um, and, uh, I mean, yeah, so, and then authors, um, let's see. You know, I don't read that many book books. Like, I listen to podcasts, and I, listen, I, I read stuff online. And uh, so I haven't had as much time to, to read books. Um, but, so I mean, I'd have to, like, I know, I'd have to, I, I do most of my reading, like, online and blogs and stuff of that nature and, and articles. But um, I, yeah, no, I haven't really, well, I, well I, let's, I'll have to ask you the question. What, what are your favorite books to read these days? <laughs> uh, I'm the worst reader in the world. Um, Mike McCanty suggested a book to me about, four months ago, and I still have about 150 pages left of it, um, mostly because I'm right now have put my focus on finishing up the uh, American Council of Exercise book so that I can take the test and become a personal trainer myself. Um, so that's where my focus is. So there's not a lot of, like, extracurricular books. Um, musicians, anything and everything, um, though I'm kind of a music snob, um, and I, I have to apologize for that sometimes because I grew up on, like, classic rock and had a little bit of classical music influence. So all of the music of the day, I'm like, oh, this rock and roll sounds like all the indie music from 10 years ago. Did it really take 10 years for indie rock and roll to become, like, mainstream? Yeah. Um, so I stick to the classics, basically. <laughs> I'm an old man. Yeah, yeah that's cool. I like, I like classics as well, for sure. Yeah. Cool. Um well, then I won't ask you what your guilty pleasure workout track is. Um, I usually enjoy asking that question. Someone once told me they work out the Katy Perry, um, which I laughed at. Um, so what is your what is the one exercise or the lift that you really, really hate to do? Well, actually, actually, you know, I do love to, to lift. I, I do love to, like, try. I don't really listen, listen to music when I lift weights. I don't need to. But let's say I'm doing, like, uh, some jumping rope or stuff of that nature. Uh, or rest pause work, I will, like, I do enjoy music. Okay. I really love, you know, 80s new wave music. Yeah! <laughs> just, some, just some good American psycho shit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, I just, it gets me, it gets me in the, gets me in the mode. Um, yeah, so. Okay, so what is your, what is the one lift that you really hate to do? The one exercise that I hate to do? Yep, one exercise you hate to do. I think most people would probably say burpees, but... I always like to ask. <laughs> okay, yeah. I would say, like, like a good hate or like a bad hate? Because some exercises, like, you're like, oh, this is tough. But I'm like, yes, this is a great exercise. You mean, you know what? Why, not, why not both? The good hate and the bad hate. <laughs> good, good hate is definitely overstanding overhead presses are, are, are bar none, like, one of the toughest lifts. Um, because bench press or incline press, you know, you're lying down, you're just exerting that that force. But when you have to stand, contract your abs, your glutes, you know, push up an object overhead, it's just, it's just, a, it, and when you're getting really, when it's getting really, really heavy, and you're grinding out that rep, like that rep, and you're like trying to lock it out, and it's yeah. a whole other level of, of effort and, and discipline. Um, now, the one exercise that I would say I I uh, actually another exercise is freaking that, that, that I hate well, but it's amazing. It power cleans because power cleans literally it's a mental, it's mental, very mu much mental because you got to throw that weight up and you got to like be able to catch it. Um, and when you're going really really heavy and it's like questionable whether you're going to get it or not, it can it can be uh, mentally challenging. Um, but then the ones that I, I guess I hate is I would say 
you know, I, I, I built my, well, I mean, I started my strength training career with lots of squats and deadlifts, but I don't really do them anymore because for me, um, when you get really strong at them, your legs just get too big and they, oh, yeah. <laughs> they get your pants, they, you know, your inner thighs are like chafing together and it's just like, it, it's just too much. So I don't, so I mean, squats and deads, I don't really do them too much anymore. As well, I mean, I also had I injured my back um, when I was like 14, and so I have to be really com careful with spinal compression. Anything that like compresses my spine uh, right. brings the energy that brings the injury like back and, and makes it like takes it out of its dormant status. So um, I have to be careful with with spinal compression. So yeah, if I do heavy squats, okay, my legs will be rubbing together, my pants will be like well, won't fit, and I'll be like when I sit down, my back will like kill. So Squats, I, I don't. And you don't need to do squats to build a great physique and get strong and powerful. You don't. Um, but but uh, they're great for putting on muscle, but it's not the only way. Right, right. Yeah, I, I too got to the point where I put my jeans on one day and I was like, all right, I got I to gotta calm down the squats a little bit. I'm going to focus on like front squats and just like, you know, doing light weights and, and higher reps because – I, I want to wear pants. I don't want to wear shorts all the time. I don't know how anyone does that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're coming from a frame of mind, you're like, you know, you're just trying to build a certain proportion. Well then once you get your legs to their ideal size, then it's like, okay, let's stop growing them. Yeah. Um, because there's also, as a natural, you can't become 250 pounds of muscle. So eventually you're going to hit a point where, you know, your lean body mass is maxed out. And so if you're carrying a lot of your size in your legs, that could very well cap the amount of muscle you can put on your upper body. Right. Uh, this is something that people do not talk about because they tell you, well, build your legs, will increase your testosterone, help you build more muscle on your upper body. Well, there's very little research to show that's actually true. Um, so uh, they actually, there's actually research to show the opposite is true. But, but um, yeah, so just something to think about for sure. Okay. Cool. Um, so let's we'll, we'll talk wrap up a little uh, talking about you and, and your business and things you have going on, and then I'll, I'll uh, close out with a with a final question. So, do you have anything new? I know you uh, on your website on KenoBody.com, you have the Greek God program. Um, oh, what's the other one? Now I'm forgetting it. Um, the superhero bulking program. Yes, the superhero bulking program, yeah. program and then that's a, lot, the, uh, that's a lot of names, a lot of stuff to think about. Yeah. <laughs> and the, and the warrior program as well. Yeah. Um, do you have anything new that you're working on? Uh, you know, for the new year or that you're putting out soon? Yeah, yeah, I do. So, well, just to kind of recap, there people might people might be like, why do you have these three courses? Why not just one? Well, the warrior training program is my course to cutting down. If you need to drop your body fat so you get really lean and chiseled. That's that's the warrior shredding program. The Greek God program is for building strength and adding muscle, getting that sort of like that Troy, that that uh, Brad Pitt and Troy kind of physique. And then the uh, the superhero bulking program uses more of a, a volume approach, more rest pause training to maximize your muscle growth and to get like that that almost like that Chris Hemsworth um, superhero physique. So, but then again, like if you're a beginner, don't start with superhero bulking program because you're not strong enough. Like stop. Right. Like start with the Greek God program. Um, and and so I'm working on I'm working on something right now. It's it's uh, it's almost you know it's 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 almost done. Um, and that's like essentially my cardio and ab and mobility course. So in each of my three courses I mentioned just previously, the protocol is you strength train three days a week to maximize full recovery, and you do it in a way to focus on like a certain proportion. So you don't need to do tons of volume on your legs. You need to hit your legs, but not tons of volume. So you can actually build incredible physique, get better results training three days per week, focusing on the stuff that really builds the physique and giving yourself tons of rest. So then the question comes, well, what do I do on those other four days? If I want to get as fit as possible, if I want to you know, get as chiseled as possible, um, then what do I do on the four days? And so um, most approaches to cardio um, don't work very well because they, they, they mess up with your neural recovery. So if you're going to do some intense, high-intensity interval training or sprints, that would actually, in essence, um, reduce your your recovery for your your, your uh, the work of the next day because it takes a toll on your central nervous system. Um, so it creates total body neural fatigue. Um, that's one of the problems. Another problem is uh, a lot of cardio workouts they cause interference, meaning for you, as you progress on these cardio workouts, it actually takes away from your adaptations towards your strength and power workouts. So that's an, an issue with people that do a lot of cardio is that. 
I mean, you're never going to see, like, some super strong jack dude, like, winning a marathon. It's not going to happen. It's because all that muscle and strength does not support his ability to run 26 miles. Um, and so most cardio approaches, they mess up with recovery, they cause interference, and they also do the, – they, they do too they, – maybe they're boring, they, they do way too much. So um, it can mess up with your appetite, so now you're too hungry to stick to your nutrition. And, and so I've devised a, a routine to maximize fat loss while without triggering your appetite, without cutting into recovery, without causing interference. And then I've also stacked um, really sweet ab and mobility routines. So some people that watch my videos on YouTube, they see me doing some pretty cool ab exercises, you know, dragon flags and like, advanced hang leg raises and, and stuff like that. I, I, I got to say the dragon flags are, are pretty crazy. And the, the, the like, um, was it the flagpole thing? Flag, yeah. Look? Yeah. That, Blew me away, dude. <laughs> yeah, those are cool. And uh, like, you know, and then like the back bridging, um, and, and really cool mobility movements. So what these ex what, what these workouts will do is, you know, they're, they're, they're fun. You know, you don't have to kill yourself. You'll burn some fat, um, and you'll, you know, you'll, you'll develop your abs very well, get strong chiseled abs, and you'll build more mobility. So if sometimes if you lift heavy three days a week, you don't do anything else, your joints can take a, take a toll. But when you do some mobility work on the other days, it just, you know, um, loosens up those joints and, you know, gives you more blood flow and just helps with recovery and stuff of that nature. So um, I found it, so I've, I've actually been doing these workouts for a few years now. Sometimes I'll take a few months off, sometimes I won't, but um, they've helped insurmountably. So this is kind of like the missing link. And then of course, and I'm working on my, finally I've gotten hundreds of emails from women being like, Gregory, which courses for women? I'm like, well, none of them are really written specifically for women. So hold on. And so <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I am working on a women's course, like taking the same kind of principles um, and, you know, creating course for women with their goals in mind, the Keto Body Physique for women, which is essentially girls just want to have, like, you know, they want to be strong and fit, but they don't want to have too much muscle. They want to have, like, a light, light amount of definition and, like, toned and feminine and all that. So, and they also want to keep their legs slim and they want to perk up their butt and all that stuff. And, and, and uh, well, most, most routines for women, like, they're so subjugated on marketing. It's crazy. And the, the, the actual effectiveness is just not there because they create routines to help women get toned and they don't actually understand what like they don't te they, they, the authors don't even talk about what real muscle tone is muscle tone is just having low body fat and strong muscles with little body fat and so they get you do like all these like leg kicks and fire hydrant circles and it does nothing for you um, and the nutrition for women is, is it, I mean there's so many myths going around like I think it's worse for women so I'm creating a course that to help women and I'm doing that with actually one of um Del Farrell, she's really cool. She, uh, yeah. yeah, she lost a ton of weight. She got really fit, and she, she really knows her stuff. And so I actually coached her, and so um, we're going to work on the stuff together. So it will be cool, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you, you have some, some new stuff coming out, and I, I'm sure that the, uh, the ladies will benefit from, from your, your program because, as I said, I, I instituted some reverse pyramid training, put on um, some good size up in the chest area finally, um, so much now that my wife looks at me and she's like, I like your boobs. And I'm like, shut up, woman. <laughs> but she likes my boobs. Yeah. They have, to, they, have to, they have to call you, they have to call them boobs. They can't give you the. They do. Like, they well, what else are you used to? Like, I don't, what, but you can't, I'm, my pectacles? No, sounds too much like testicles. And then that's like a weird thing where someone's going to think, yeah, I don't even want to. So just you call know, them. You know what it is? They just, they just, they just can't have you, you can't have your confidence too high, you know? They oh. Can't have your confidence too high. It's dangerous. Oh. They got to keep it in check. Keep the ego in check. That's why I married the woman that I did because mine gets up here and she she brings me back down a notch or two and I'm like, oh, you're right, you're right. <laughs> you got to call the boobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So so my final question before I, I take out the podcast. Um, so fitness is not the only interest you have and it's not the only interest anyone in the business has. Um, so what is one non-fitness goal that you want to accomplish in your life? Right. Okay. Uh, one non-fitness goal. I am a man of several goals. Um, non-fitness. Well, uh, ah, you're putting me on the spot here. <laughs> okay. Um, um, wow. You know, how, you you go first. Now I'm all I'm all I'm all shy and. Uh, <laughs> oh, I got Greg shy. Uh oh. <laughs> Um, no, I just I think it's interesting to find out. Um, 
I like asking more than just fitness stuff because I think a lot of people when you – sometimes, you know, there's a lot of fitness podcasts that are out there, and there's a lot of information out there that trainers put out. And I think people think that trainers are these certain types of people, and, and they're not. Um, so I kind of like everyone to understand that, you know what, these, everyone's come from, from similar circumstances, and everyone's put in the hard work, and you can get the same place that any anyone has gotten to. It's just hard work. Um, but I think it's also kind of cool to see what other things people enjoy yeah, as well. well. You know, I, I've had several – I've had several goals that came up organically throughout the years as, as I've been involved in fitness. And, like, you know, it started off like I wanted to be more social because I was just that shy kid. Yeah. And so I wanted to become, you know, just more talkative, more social. And – that I did that and you know um, and and then so I mean yeah I mean this there's just for me it's like most guys we want to you know become really fit we want to you know succeed in our business or our career uh, we want to you know do really well with, with women and our relationships and and uh, and so um, and then of course we want to become happy and fulfilled and you don't get that from seeking goals in the future you get that from really accepting what is here right now um, so I guess you know, I, I, I'm pretty like, like, I, so for, I mean, to, to, to answer your question, really, I, um, my, the last, my entire life up until, like, you know, recently, it's always been chasing, obsessing about the future. It's like, I'm not happy here. I want to be over there. Mm -hmm. I want to have what that guy has. I want to, <clears throat> like, life would be way cooler when I'm over here. So, it was just this chronic obsession, obsession to get to this next point, this next point. When you get there, it's like cool for like two days, and then you're like, I don't feel happy. Yeah. More. Yeah. So, I guess I guess my goal for 2015 is really just to. I mean, I've done a lot. I, I I've I've achieved a ton of my goals in fitness and outside of fitness. I just really just want to focus on just enjoying it, spending more time with my friends, uh, my family, and just kind of really embracing becoming grateful for what I have embracing everything around me as opposed to like just trying to kill myself trying to get something else that I don't need so my goal is just it's very arbitrary you know it's uh, but I just like want to just really like really uh, just appreciate what I have and just in just enjoy just spend my t enjoy you know my free time more just and in, in, enjoy the now actually I think that's that's great and I think that's a great way to kind of kind of take the show out is is to enjoy the now because I Personally, I struggle with that. I think everyone struggles with that because you do. You get these goals and you get these aspirations and these dreams, and we kind of forget. You know, we forget the good things. Going back to what I said, two good things that happen in a day. You kind of forget the good things that happen. That you're still alive. You're still breathing. If you're walking, your legs are working. Your arms are working. Hopefully, you know, um, there's always something. Um, I, I I like that, Greg. I like that. Yeah, yeah. That's. I don't need like. I don't need like. You know, everything. I don't need a ton to be happy. I just. Me, like like to enjoy my food and good friends and and uh, work out and and do my do what I love writing do videos and podcasts and I mean like I just want to enjoy it and, and uh, yeah I'm gonna be working towards stuff as well like, I'm gonna be working on uh, building my business and, and you know working on certain goals but like I just want to like just enjoy you know enjoy that whole process and I think this is a realization that people probably make when they're 40 um, <laughs> I made it a lot earlier because I was what I was probably like like way more obsessed about getting to the future than most people so I'm like it just, it just, it just did it too much I'm like okay this isn't working let's let's enjoy let's enjoy what we have right now so cool cool well if people want to find you uh, besides uh, kinobody.com uh, which is your website uh, where else can they find you on social media yeah so I'm like really active on Instagram um, uh, that's Greg O Gallagher so Instagram, um, so if you go to Instagram and you're at Greg O'Gallagher, G-R-E-G-O-G-A-L-L-A-G-H-E-R. That's where I post pictures and write captions and stuff of that nature. Um, and then Facebook, um, on Facebook, if you go to facebook.com slash Fitness, I'm there. Um, but if you go onto my page, you got to make sure to, like, uh, make sure to get notified. So there's a button. If you click it, you can, like, get notifications. Otherwise, you know, you could – Probably you'll probably never come across my my Facebook posts because Facebook <laughs> makes like it, it makes it really hard to, to, to reach out to people that like your page. So you gotta make sure to to go to the like button and then put your cursor over it and then like go down to get notifications. Um, you should do that to all the pages that you like on Facebook that you want to stay notified. You gotta do that. So um, yeah, that's usually Facebook, Instagram are, are my two main ones, and uh, and yeah, and then my blog, and that's it. Cool. 
All right. Well, uh, I've, I've enjoyed having you on the show and, and learning. Uh, hopefully my listeners have learned a little about uh, reverse pyramid training and how it can actually help uh, improve and, and they can hit some PRs out there. Uh, and I've enjoyed having you on the show. And uh, again, um, congrats on all the, the, the great things that are going on over at Kino Body uh, and in your realm as well. And thank you for coming on, Greg. Dude, thank you so much. This has been an absolute blast. I've really enjoyed it. You know, it's, uh, I, you know, I could have talked all day. It's great. So. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, again, thank you for coming on. And uh, everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show.